Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, the next speaker is Professor Stephen Feiner. Uh, professor Stephen Feiner got his PhD from Brown University and he's a professor of computer science at Columbia University now, uh, where he directs the computer graphics and user interfaces lab. His research interests include human computer interaction, augmented reality, virtual environments, 3D user interfaces, knowledge based design of graphics and multimedia mobile and wearable computing, computer games, and information visualization. Professor Feiner is the co-author of Computer Graphics, Principles and Practice of, uh, Introduction to Computer Graphics is the name of the book. And he's also been the program chair of various uh, um, conferences and committees. I request Professor Feiner to come and deliver his talk. Thanks. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to have an opportunity to tell you about some of the fun stuff that my students and I get to do in the name of computer science research. So look at that rather long title I have up over there. And there's probably a phrase that you might not know, which is augmented reality. And so I'll begin by telling you what augmented reality is. So augmented reality refers to the idea of taking virtual content, media of various sorts, and combining it with our perception of the real world. And the idea is to do this interactively and do it in a way in which the two things, what you experience in the real world and what the virtual stuff does, end up being registered, that is to say, be, they end up being aligned in 3D. To give you an example of this, I have an image from an old piece of work that we did back in the mid-90s. Um, this shows some cylindrical struts and one spherical node that are part of a building system. This is what you actually make what are called space frame buildings from. Here we're seeing a photo. And here we're seeing a very, very simple, very primitive example of 3D graphics. There is a abstract representation in bright red of one of those struts, a little wireframe node, and a little arrow that actually spins when this is running live. And by itself, this is, well, you know, what's going on there? There's a strut, there's a node, there's a little arrow, and some text. Now, when you combine them together, on the other hand, in place, this is basically instructions that are explaining to someone which strut to put in place against which node, and then to turn by turning the little collar that you don't actually see there to attach the strut to the node with one piece of instruction applied at a time to essentially show you in place how to put the building together. So interesting thing over here, two things actually. One of them is that the way I defined augmented reality at the top, I didn't actually mention graphics in particular. It turns out that a lot of what I'm going to talk about is uh, visual augmented reality, but this can be any uh, kind of modality. It can be things that you see, but also things you hear, smell, taste, feel, etc. So, interesting thing about the virtual content, because it's supplementing rather than replacing what you're experiencing of the real world, the real world's still there. We have to pay attention to it, and therefore the virtual stuff needs to complement, needs to respect the stuff that's there for real. This is not like being given a big black rectangle of a monitor, for example, as dark as possible when there's nothing up there. You own every pixel, and you control everything that you see. Instead, we're looking at the real world. If there's something over there that, that's important to us, we have to make sure that the virtual stuff doesn't obscure it. If you're crossing the street, you don't want to have a car that's maybe getting ready to run you over be concealed by virtual stuff. You want to pay attention to the important things that are happening in the real world. So that's actually an interesting design challenge that I'll try to address during the process of, of talking about this work. So what I want to do is give you a little bit of an understanding of how we display stuff augmented reality. There's many different ways to do it, 
and just a very, very high level sketch of an understanding of how we do this kind of registration, this kind of tracking we often call it of things in the real world. So in terms of AR displays, one of the main kinds is what we call optical see-through. And here I'm actually going from talking about things in a modality independent way to really talking about things that are visual. In an optical see-through display, what we have basically is a display which you're seeing positioned somewhere above and near the user's head. There's some optics, think of lenses and mirrors, and you're basically looking through those optics at the real world, and you're seeing as well, in this case maybe a reflection from perhaps just a simple piece of glass, the little display. And if the display has virtual graphics on it, then its image is being combined with what you see in the real world, and we now have virtual and real stuff combined, all courtesy of optics. Now, there's another way to go and do AR, and that's what we call video see-through. And here, instead of looking at the real world directly, you're actually looking at a display, and there's one or more cameras that are looking at the real world, and then the camera view and the virtual graphics are being combined in the computer using techniques pretty much the same as the ones that are used in uh, movie special effects. And this combination then gets fed to the display, so we look just at the display, and the only way we see the real world is through the camera imagery. And then finally, just for completeness sake, we can, we can do something else. We can take our display, let's say it's a projector, we can project onto the real world directly, and then we can combine what we see in the real world with what the graphics provides us by literally just looking at real stuff that happens to have projected stuff on top of it. So we're actually combining in the environment. These are the three main ways in which we do augmented reality. And then we can take a cross product with the various ways in which these displays and optical elements can be located relative to you. And in particular, you can wear the display, you might wear it on your head, for example, in which case it might be even closer than those pictures are showing over there. You can hold the display, perhaps in the hand, um, as you might with a smartphone that has a camera built into it. So I'm not wearing it on my head, but I'm holding it in my hand and looking around. I can even have it in the environment, where I can walk up to it and I can see, courtesy of the stuff in the environment, this combination of real stuff and virtual stuff. So I've given you kind of an abstract understanding, and during the course of the talk, I'll show you some examples of uh, some of these kinds of displays and uh, try to explain what some of their differences are. Now, I also said we have to track, we need to register things, and so I'm going to try to give you a very high-level kind of meta-understanding of how this stuff works. And basically, the goal here is we wanted to determine the position and the orientation of objects, for example, your head or your hand if you're holding something, or objects in the domain. Maybe it's a ball game and we want to be able to augment the ball, or it's a race, we want to augment the racers with information about them. And so basic approach is you have some kind of sensor that's sensitive to some kind of signal, and it's going to determine its position and orientation relative to a signal that it detects from some source. So the sensor could be on an object that's actually being tracked and viewing some source that's at a particular known position and orientation, or we could have the sensor itself be at some known position and orientation and it viewing the source that's attached to, or maybe even is, the object being tracked. So again, I'm being very, very generic over here, trying to cover pretty much every way of doing this. And furthermore, um, it, you can actually use the signal properties, if they can be categorized in some interesting way, to determine not just that you're tracking something, but the identity of the thing that you're tracking. So let me, let me try to make this a little bit more specific. There's lots of ways to do this. I've mentioned some on this little list over here. You can use computer vision. You can use optical things that aren't really quite yet cameras. You can use ultrasound, electromagnetism. Uh, you can pay attention to things that the Earth does. For example, the Earth has a magnetic field and a gravitational field. You can send up little satellites um, full of all kinds of expensive technology and use those, which is what GPS does. Lots and lots of ways to do this. Let me give you a couple of examples. Let's say we have a camera. The camera can view patterns of features that are in the real world. And I can give you an example over here. 
um, the image at the very top shows a bunch of these little black and white pattern squares. Those little patterns make each one of those little pattern squares capable of being uniquely re recognized as having a particular identity. And the system is told in advance what the patterns are. And as well, it knows they're all going to be squares, perfect squares of a particular size. And if you look at those squares with a camera, depending upon how the camera is positioned and oriented, the squares will project not as squares, but more generally as quadrilaterals whose sides are not all the same length, whose angles are not all 90 degrees. And it's some very nice, elegant mathematics that lets you, if you know the length of the sides and the angles, figure out the position and orientation of the camera relative to these little patterned uh, squares that it's looking at in the real world. Um, now, those are kind of uh, ugly and op art looking. If you go let one image down below, what you're looking at is a image of a bunch of little stones. And it turns out that, as you can see, the very fact that you can actually make them out to be stones is in part due to the fact that there's some very dark parts and very light parts. There's lots of contrast, especially around the edges of the stone. And there are ways of being able to go and look at, or have an algorithm look at, this collection of pixels and find places, especially ones where the statistics are, are kind of interesting, like there's a very, very dark thing fading to something very rapidly that's very, very bright. And the idea is that the system can essentially take note of these features and compare them with ones that have been analyzed to be in that source material um, before actually looking at it with a camera. And then by determining the sizes and shapes and positions, be able to figure out the camera position and orientation relative to it. And then finally, just for completeness, I've mentioned yet a completely different approach in which a GPS receiver can listen to signals coming from satellites and uh, any of a number of different constellations, GPS being the US one, but there are other ones as well up there um, circling the Earth. Um, and the idea is that the signals that it listens to have information about where the satellites are very precisely uh, uh, located. Um, information about when the signals are actually being broadcast and therefore can figure out how far it is from each of a set of satellites at known locations, plug that into lots of really, really cool math that happily if you're a user you don't have to understand because it gets very, very messy, um, and then be able to go and figure out the position of that receiver relative to all this stuff. So. I've given you a sort of high-level overview. Let me talk about a couple of specific examples of things we can do with augmented reality. So if we're doing this outside, we can overlay information on things that we'd like to find out more stuff about. And so here's an example from a, a restaurant guide that my students and I did back in 2001 for a conference that was held in New York, in which you're seeing, as you look at this restaurant across the street, you're seeing a little information sheet that's overlaid on top of it off to the side that lets you have access to its web page, uh, to its menu, and to some reviews about it. Now, back when we did this in the mid-90s to early 2000s, there were no smartphones you could do this with. Uh, the computers you needed to do it with are kind of bulky, and we actually had this ridiculous-looking backpack that my former student, Herb Ibenko, over there is wearing with this crazy-looking antenna rising up from the top and this sort of weird-looking outer space uh, head-worn display and complementing that, this handheld uh, tablet. And all of the things that we did on this kind of device back around the turn of the century are things you can now do even better on essentially any smartphone. So other fun things we can do, well, games. I mean, there's all sorts of wonderful applications for games. I get paid in part to go and come up with cool games. So this is an example of a marble maze game in which you're holding in your hand a, a bit of uh, fiber uh, board. Um, and all it has on it, as you can see in that picture at the upper left, is literally just one of these patterns like I showed you before. There is a camera that's being worn in the head-worn display, um, or two cameras if we're doing this in stereo. And then the camera or cameras are tracking um, the board and its position and orientation relative to the display. And the display also has built into it some sensors can, that can sense the acceleration of Earth's gravitational field so they know which way is down. And put that all together, we can then decorate that otherwise completely, absolutely empty board with some virtual stuff. 
And so here you're seeing basically that little board game. You're seeing that instead of me playing it as I tilt it, the dice move around, the ball rolls. We have to get past those little bouncy things over there. And then we have to go and somehow get through past all those little dice. And this is all done just by tilting the board, which if you're someone who likes to play games but maybe is a little intimidated by, a, uh, say, an Xbox controller or a similar kind of controller with lots of buttons and joysticks, here it's just a little panel that you can go and play with. And it's much less intimidating than if I were trying to play with something with a lot of buttons and switches and gigaws on it. So here's another application. Um, things aren't all fun in games. Let's say we have something that's really important that it be in good shape, that it be maintained, or something that when it breaks, it has to get fixed. So augmented reality can be used to provide instructions to explain to a person how to fix something. And as it turns out, I'll try to explain to you, you can actually show that there are situations in which augmented reality lets you fix things better faster with fewer errors than if you're using more conventional kinds of documentation. So this is an image of a Marine, a US Marine, who's taking part in one of the studies that my lab has done trying to compare using AR versus using more classical kind of computer-based, laptop-based documentation um, to find where things are and fix them. So what I want to do is to tell you a little bit about one project we have um, in which we're looking particularly at tasks that involve doing things with parts of the environment, um, assembling pieces together to make something, disassembling, replacing, pushing, pulling, poking stuff in order to be able to go and, in this case, put something together. This is an aircraft engine that we happen to have sitting around in our lab because it provides a very nice domain in which to work. So I'm going to tell you a bit about this work, which is uh, part of the thesis of my now former PhD student, Steve Henderson. And to tell you about this, I'm going to show you a little video. And this one that I'm going to show you now, like the one that I just showed you before, is shot with a video see-through display. And then I'll show you some stuff shot through an optical see-through display. And so in this case, we're going to see a little bit of some instructional material created with the system that's going to show you how to pick up a combustion chamber that's part of this engine, that's currently not where it should be on the engine, and then orient it the right way and insert it into the engine where it belongs. So here we're seeing a view through one eye of the stereo display. And we now have a label, so it's combustion chamber three. There's a little red arrow pointing to it. We reach out, grab hold of it. And then the system is now tracking using that kind of pattern I showed you before. The arrow means, gee, I have to turn that combustion chamber following the arrow. And soon I see this little placard on it. Well, the placard's upside down. We have to make it right side up. And if we make it right side up, we're now going to be holding this thing in the right orientation. And then we're going to go and move it over to where it belongs on the engine. And you're going to see this little representation there, a sort of transparent representation of where that physical combustion chamber is supposed to go to in the engine. And so if you look at something like that, you say, gee, you know, this looks kind of cool. We think it looks cool. Most people who see it think it looks cool. But of course, if you're trying to fix something, you know, looking cool isn't enough. The question is, does this work? Is this really a good way to go and do something? And so what I'm going to do is to tell you a little bit about a study that my students and I did to try to be able to figure out whether AR can actually be shown to be better than conventional, which nowadays in high-end maintenance means computer-based documentation. So a lot of documentation provided in the military now is done with stuff running on a laptop that essentially shows you how to perform tasks, and you follow one step after another, press uh, the appropriate button to indicate that you're ready to do the next step, and essentially you're being shown how to perform a task. So the task we're going to do over here is one that involves those combustion chambers. I just showed you a fully completed combustion chamber, and the one that we decided to do is one that involves assembling a combustion chamber. You're seeing on the left a bottom part of one. There's a top part of one at the bottom. The two of them assembled uh, one over. And then the workplace in which we did this, in which we have essentially a set of bins with three of those bottoms, three of the tops. And the idea is to have the system explain to you which bottom, which top, 
and how to orient the top relative to the bottom so it's correctly oriented. And then there's going to be two places where you're going to stick some pins in to finish the job. Normally, if this were being done for real, there's actually 20 bolts that need to be inserted. But augmented reality is really not going to help with that. And so we wanted to just point out two holes to put the pins inside of. So we did a study that's what's called a within-subject study. That means that each one of the subjects tried things both different ways. And one thing we want to avoid is giving bias in favor or against one way versus the other. So half the subjects basically started with the augmented reality documentation and then did the conventional, I'm calling it LCD-based doc, and the other half did it the other way around. We randomized which chamber bottom and which chamber top and which pairs of holes a person was going to be instructed to line up and put together. And you're seeing over here just a couple of images of one subject in our AR condition and then one subject in our LCD condition. So let's talk a little bit about the AR condition. So what does a person actually see? This is an optical see-through display. And what they're going to see is what they see in the real world through the optics of the display. And then overlaid on top of that, you can actually see it on the monitor in the background, one of the eyes, is the extra material that's being overlaid and registered on what she's seeing. In a couple of seconds, I'll show you some stills, and then I'll show you a little video of what this looks like actually running. So what do we do to try to explain to a person how to perform the task? And in our case, we actually did a whole bunch of things, some of which might maybe not be necessarily all that useful. We're kind of throwing in everything but the kitchen sink, as we would say. And here, what you're going to see is, and this is kind of a key to the video you're going to see, which will go by fairly quickly. You're seeing some highlights of the particular bottom or top, the source and destination, um, highlighted in yellow on the left there. Some motion paths that are giving you sort of an approximate idea of which way to move the piece that needs to be moved into place. Um, we have some arrows once a top is on the bottom. The system is tracking these pieces as they move, so it can actually move you on to the next step. And so that little red arrow, for example, means you should really turn the top relative to the bottom in that direction. That's the most efficient direction to turn it to get it to line up. And red means you're kind of far away. In this case, the J has to line up with the 17 over there. And you can see those little labels, which are basically made to always face you. And if you actually look up a little more closely over here, here we've got a green arrow. Um, the top and bottom are nearly in place. And there's some little highlights you're seeing about the holes that need to line up. And then when they really line up, the arrow goes away, and the, the two little highlights kind of merge into one over there. So now I'll show you an example of what this looks like. This is actually shot with an optical see-through display. And the way we do that is we can't really put a camera literally in your eye. And so we have a fiberglass head. We have a camera inside the head. The head wears the display. And then to make this particular video, we had one of my students was holding that head as if it were his own head. And another one was kind of reaching around to go and do this. Of course, that's not the way we actually do the study, but it's the way in which we uh, recorded the, the video. And so let's actually run that and uh, see what that looks like. Probably want to lower the volume over here, maybe a little bit lower. And so now we're seeing through one eye, and there is the bottom that we need to pick up, grab hold of it. The system is tracking these things using the kind of motion capture, as we call it, system that's used in a lot of filmmaking. And now we have to get the top part. And then as it gets close to the bottom, the system knows, OK, we're ready to go and orient them correctly. And the yellow arrow says that's the way you need to turn things. In this case, lining up that Q with the 19 over there. And as they get closer and closer, it goes to green. And then ultimately, it kind of disappears. And then we're going to go and put a pin in the Q slot. This is on a little lazy Susan, so it turns around easily. And then put the pin in the J slot, hit the button, and we're done over there. So that's what AR looks like. Thank you. And now we're going to see what the quotes classical documentation looks like. And so this is an LCD panel up in front of you. We're actually doing some of the same tricks we did in AR, 
really to make this a fair comparison between AR and non-AR, we didn't want to have the user have to say when the next task needed to get done. So we're tracking things the same way, and we're basically automatically moving you on to the next step based on the same motions of the parts, which unfortunately current documentation doesn't do. We wanted to make believe we had maybe another turn around the wheel for uh, existing documentation systems. And so all the images over there are actually being rendered on the fly by the system from uh, very nice high resolution models of the parts. And we like to think that we did a pretty good job as was concerned, confirmed by the folks who actually did these things, saw both of the, the different ways of doing things uh, in creating this kind of, quotes, classical documentation. So let me tell you a little bit about our study. Um, we had 22 participants. Um, and what they experienced is when they came in, um, they got a little introduction. And we had a little video prepared to explain things to them. We gave them a stereo vision test, because it's very important for them to have stereo to do this kind of near field task, like putting that pin in, for example. Um, and then for each of the two conditions, depending upon the order in which they had to do it, they got an instructional video for that condition. They got a little practice block of trying it out until they got comfortable with it. And then we gave them a set of trials. And when they were done, we then went on to the next condition, whatever that was for them. And then they got a questionnaire when it was all over in which we asked them questions about what they found comfortable, uncomfortable, which one they liked the best, et cetera. And it turns out that based on some hypotheses we came up with during an earlier so-called pilot study, um, we hypothesized that AR is going to be faster for the alignment and pinning. And it turns out it took just a little bit more than around half the time, as we expected. Um, AR was going to be more accurate. And measuring accuracy by whether the right holes were aligned within a half hole width of each other it's significantly better accuracy in this actually very hard to do task if you're doing it without the overlaid stuff, looking up at a picture and trying to match the various features uh, as, just as a human being doing the matching on the top and bottom pieces to get them to line up right. Um, and as well, people uh, told us in their questionnaire that they preferred um, AR and they found it more intuitive. And one thing that we were very happy about is that display, as you saw before, that big bulky, that weighs around one kilogram display that they were wearing, uh, that was worn only in the AR condition. In the LCD condition, we were tracking their head, because we wanted to be able to say things about how their head was positioned and oriented. But we used a very, very lightweight uh, band around the head that didn't weigh anything near what that very big, very bulky head-worn display weighed. So having told you a little bit about some of these things we've done, what I want to do is to talk some, tell you something about where I think AR is heading in terms of both things in the lab and as well things out there in the real world. Because I think this is going to be something that ultimately is going to be a fundamental part of the way in which people interact with computers. Because right now, you can, for pretty much any smartphone platform, you can actually download for free a variety of AR apps. But not a lot of people download them. And the ones who download them, not a lot of people actually use them. So the first thing I think is going to happen is that, as I said, this is going to become ubiquitous. AR is going to become a fundamental way in which most people interact with stuff. Now, the images I'm showing you here are a variety of applications, some research ones, like the one in the upper left from a number of years ago. Um, and a number of systems that, that again, are, you can just download right now running on a variety of different smartphone platforms. Now, the problem with these is you have to take your phone out and turn it on and hold it up like this or in one hand maybe like that. And it kind of looks funny and it takes a long time to set up. And, and you know, there's a lot of other things that are wrong with this model. So basically, I think this stuff's going to become ubiquitous when AR eyewear becomes ubiquitous and commonplace. Now, when I say that, I showed you some pictures before. This is the one we used in that maintenance experiment. That thing weighs around a kilo. It costs a lot of money. You don't want to walk down the street wearing this thing. And it's uncomfortable. Okay, other than that, it's actually fairly nice. Um, the one at the bottom, much less expensive commercial video see-through display. And both of these are really things that researchers would use, maybe if they were good enough and cheap enough and better than they are enough. Uh, people playing games might use them, probably sitting down rather than standing up, because 
these things do a pretty good job of weighing heavily on your head and blocking your experience or degrading at least your experience of the real world. So I think this is really not what I'm talking about. Okay? Now here's something, another picture that many of you have maybe seen this particular picture or variants of it. This is something called Google Glass. Um, and many of you may recognize the person wearing it over there. And this is actually a very, very nice example of being able to, to build something courtesy of current day technology that can be very lightweight, self-contained. The computer is actually part of this head-worn display. It's a little tiny display positioned off to the side and above one of the eyes. Um, there's a little camera built into that. And the problem is, well, this can be a very nice way of getting computational stuff into your field of view, but it's not really tracking things in the real world. It's not overlaying directly on them, because as you can see, if he's looking at you, well, he's not also at the same time looking at that display. He has to look up to go and look into it. It's not overlaying the majority of his field of view. It's not doing it in stereo either. And in fact, nice though this is, it actually owes a lot to a variety of things people have been doing back, in fact, last century. To me, that sounds very wrong to say that, but to you it probably feels like, oh, of course, that was like, you know, not before I was born, but a long time ago. But last century, there were a number of companies that made things that didn't look totally different, okay? But in both of these cases over here, the displays that are being worn are literally just displays. They don't have cameras in them. They don't have computers in them. And they need to go out to external computation with a cable, as you're seeing on the right at the lower left picture. And in fact, the person on the right bottom at IBM Research is actually holding the impressively small for its time computer that was powering this thing. And so really neat how advanced we've gotten, even though at first glance these might look the same, um, from the end of the 20th century to 2012. But again, I don't think this is it, okay? Um, now here we're getting a little warmer. These are kind of stupid looking. Um, but these are both stereo optical see-through displays. You can see the user's eyes directly, even though there's a lot of bulk on the sides over there. But these both have a kind of smallish field of view. And again, they, they look kind of strange. Now here I think we're getting even warmer. These are all working uh, prototype systems. Monocular at the top over there from just around the year 2000. And then uh, two stereo uh, displays. Uh, one from a little company in Israel um, and one from a, a rather large company in Japan. Um, both of which are ones where you can look the person in the eye um, and although these don't look really gorgeous, they weren't things that had their industrial design done by wonderful industrial designers. These are more designed by the kind of people who did the, the technology itself. And there's no reason why something that has that kind of functionality can't be designed to look really, really gorgeous and desirable and work really well and also be really, really inexpensive if it's made in large enough quantity. So let me move on to talking about another thing I think is going to be important. And that's the notion of heterogeneity. I think at this point you can probably note I'm a big fan of the future prospects of very small, very powerful, wearable displays. But on the other hand, I don't believe that that means that you know, everyone else can sort of pack up and go home, and we're not going to have very large displays on walls and on floors and on tabletops, let alone ones that you hold in your hands. And so this is some work in which we put together a set of different displays. This is um, a rear projected first generation Microsoft Surface uh, display, which is the substrate on top of which you're seeing a set of buildings um, courtesy of uh, Bing and uh, Google, excuse me, Bing uh, uh, Maps, uh, which are basically being seen through a video see-through display that is looking at the tabletop surface and being tracked relative to it. And so if I show you some video over here, this might make a little bit more sense. Again, we're looking through the video see-through display. All of those buildings are positioned on top of their footprints. And then we can look around and see some of the other fun stuff I have in the lab off in the distance there. And then we can do the classical things of being able to go and scale and translate and rotate as we move around over there. And in this case, we're just putting up just plain 
building models. And here we're seeing the same kind of thing, but we have some additional pictorial uh, pictographic representations of data coming from a variety of different sites, like Yelp, for example. And now we're going to bring in a smartphone that's also being tracked. And we can use that to communicate with the stuff over there, um, get more information about some of the things we're looking at, interact with some of the pieces over here. So in this case, you'll see that icon come forward as we're trying to get some more information about it. And finally, the last thing I want to talk about, thank you. <laughs> lots and lots of student time put into doing that. That was Nick uh, Deadwall uh, and Carmen Aldezio's work. And then I neglected to mention that the stuff, or maybe I did, that you saw before that for maintenance was work done by uh, Steve Henderson. So now I'm going to talk about collaboration, because I think collaboration is really important, especially as things get smaller and smaller and we can walk around in the environment. And there's one very interesting prospect, I think, and that's for collaboration between multiple people and systems in tracking and modeling people and stuff in the environment. So we have users who want to know their own location and some interesting information, like maybe where the good restaurants are. And we have a system that wants to model the world, including the users and their interesting information. And so is there some way to sort of broker the users in the system into getting them to work together? Well, you can imagine that people want to find out where they are and consequently be able to get some really good information about things that are of interest where they are. Well, maybe they'd be willing to provide their current sensor data, including maybe camera imagery, uh, history, and things kind of like a query. In fact, exactly like a query of the sort that people use right now with search engines. And imagine the system being able to go and match that sensor data um, and the history from the users against a database uh, containing lots of camera imagery, for example, uh, with first guesses being made from satellite tracking, from the orientation trackers that any smartphone nowadays would have, and then returning, courtesy of doing these matches into this very, very rich, very large uh, database, the user's precise current position and orientation based on matching against uh, the material in it, and then, of course, also answering um, a user's query, like, you know, where are, where are the good restaurants based on the kinds of restaurants I like, and then updating the database with that sensor data that was being used in part to go and do the matches. Okay, so in a system like this, who are the users? Well, all of you guys, right? You know, many of you, in fact, probably all of you have some kind of feature phone. Many of you probably have smartphones. Many of you might even be on your nth smartphone at this point over here. And imagine that those things that I mentioned that were head-worn displays and that have cameras in them suddenly cost what a smartphone costs and then maybe even less than what a smartphone costs. Okay? So basically, imagine everyone or at least a lot of everyone's. And the result is you can get the idea of a kind of up to the minute or even up to the second augmented version of what Google would call Street View or Microsoft would call Street Side. This idea of being able to go and see imagery of the world around you and now see your relationship to it really, really accurately with added virtual stuff. And in fact, if you have a lot of people milling around, as I've certainly seen you, you have in India, um, imagine that instead of having imagery that was, oh, maybe a month old, if you're lucky, more like months to maybe even a year old, the imagery was literally really, really up to date because it was being augmented with imagery that people had taken just seconds or even fractions of a second before. So all the shop window contents are up to date. You don't get just pedestrian or road traffic. You actually know which pedestrians are there. And then something that's a little bit scary, right now, if you don't want to use a search engine, well, just keep your fingers off the keyboard or don't talk to whatever engine you currently are talking to or typing to. But if you're walking down the street and someone is passing you and their camera is capturing you and their microphones are capturing you, then it's not just the people who want to be captured, but it's the people who are just captured through other people looking at them. And based, based on face recognition, matching people up against their Facebook pages, recognition of clothing and gait, all coalesced across lots and lots of timestamp georeference data 
and at least in the US, for example, all this totally legal because it's all publicly observable behavior. You have no real right to that kind of privacy uh, when you're walking around outside. So what this ultimately gets you is it's up to the second augmented world model. Think of this as being essentially the ultimate social network, and whether you like it or not, you're going to be part of it. And you know, I think you can maybe get from some of the things that I've been saying that there's some privacy issues over here, and you want to know the consequences of screening, searching, matching, storing, all of this stuff. And part of what some of you maybe are going to be able to do is to both work on the technologies as researchers that make this possible, and also maybe, if you go into other careers, work on some of the legalities, work on some of the philosophy and sociology and, and just the deep understanding of how this stuff works. And so I've told you a little bit about uh, AR technology and applications. I've talked a bit about future directions. And I want to conclude by just acknowledging colleagues and students and uh, participants in the work and the funding agencies that made it possible. Thank you.